I have been telling you, and I, in the last hour, in fact, I, I mentioned it, and let me get back to it. I've been telling you for some years now, I mean, for the eight years we've been doing this, this program, I have been going on and on and on about, about Jude Wininski, and back in 1974, this guy said, if the Republicans want to take power, we've got to stop being the party that's viewed as, as Uncle Scrooge. We've got to stop yelling about deficits and start spending money. We've got to start giving the American people some goodies. We've got to become Santa Claus. In fact, we need to become the double Santa Claus, the two Santa Clauses. We need, when we're in power, we need to be spending money and like crazy, which makes, the, makes it look like the economy is good. It makes people very happy. And then when we're out of power, we have to stop the Democrats from doing the same by yelling about the deficit. Now comes, and, and, and uh, tip of the hat to uh, to Susan in Sacramento, who, who forwarded this to me. This is an article from 1985 in the New York Times. Now, this is the middle of the uh, Reagan administration. And Reagan had already, I mean, the, the, the deficit throughout the history of the United States, the total debt of the United not just the debt, not just the annual deficit, but the total debt of the United States, had remained relatively constant. I mean, it peaked after the Revolutionary War, and then we paid off much of it. And then it peaked after the Mexican-American War, it peaked after the Civil War. Uh, there was a, a, a peak for World War I, a peak for World War II, the Spanish-American War a little bit. But every time, you know, it got paid back over the next five or six years, and it was no big deal. And then Reagan came into office. And he started building this massive institutional debt, taking us from one trillion to two trillion to three trillion, and then Bush for, to four trillion, and then and then Clinton to five trillion, and then Bush Jr. comes in and takes us to six and seven and eight and nine and ten and eleven trillion, and now you know we're adding another trillion in the first year of the Obama administration as a consequence of the of these policies that have been cemented into place that started with the Bush or with the Reagan tax cuts on millionaires and billionaires. And I've been saying all along, this is a deliberate process that the Republicans put into place in order to, to cement power and to destroy the ability of Democrats to pursue the New Deal policies that, A, were so popular with people, B, built a strong and powerful middle class, and C, turned this nation into the most, you know, the, the, the healthiest industrial democracy in the world. The Republicans don't like that at all, because look at what happened. When people had a lot of free time, people only worked 40 hours a week, they had weekends off, their kids could go to college for free at the University of California and for really cheap pretty much everywhere else because the government had good tax revenues and was subsidizing education. We were building schools left and right. We were building brand new hospitals, bridges, roads, all that stuff that was built in the 40s, the 50s, the 60s, and the 70s that we haven't built anything since the 80s, basically. 30 years, no infrastructure that what happened, conservatives will, will tell you this, what happened was that people had their basic needs met, their basic concerns, they, they had a job, they had security, they had a pension, their kids could go to school for free, and so they started asking for freedom. The women's movement started. Women were, you know, out there literally and metaphorically burning their bras and saying, wait a minute, we want equal pay for equal work. African Americans were stepping up to the plate saying, hey, what about us? You, you promised us equality back in, in 1770, and, we've, and we'd like some of that now, please. Native Americans were speaking out. The Native American movement was started. Young people were saying, hell no, I ain't going to go off to a war that I, didn't, that, you know, I don't agree with, I didn't declare, and I think is based on a lie. From the point of view of conservatives in the 60s and 70s, the United States was in chaos. From the Limbaugh point of view, from the William F. Buckley point of view, from the Richard Nixon point of view, from the Barry Goldwater point of view, from, the, from that point of view, this country was becoming unsettled. Now, Thomas Jefferson saw the same thing happen during his generation in the 1760s and the 1770s. Because that was the time, that was the other time in the United States when there was great prosperity. And a very large and strong middle class. And it led to, an, to a revolution. It led to our saying to England, sorry, we're not going to play your game anymore. And the conservatives of that day, the Sir Edmund Burks of the world, the John Adamses of the, well, Adams, I, I, 
became conser crazy conservative later on. But the, 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 the Burks of the world. And frankly, about half the U.S. population said, nah, let's not have a revolutionary war. Back off. That freedom thing is not so important. But Jefferson thought it was a great idea. He loved to see that ferment. When the, when, the, when the revolution began in France, he wrote about how sometimes the tree of liberty needs to be watered by the blood of patriots, a phrase that, the, that Tim McVeigh had on his T-shirt when he was arrested. So the ferment that, that produced the American Revolution was also happening in the 60s. So the Republicans said, we've got to stop this. So the way that we stop this is we make school expense expensive so the kids will not protest. We, we cut back on middle-class jobs. We throw our workers into competition with cheap labor all over the world, and we create a huge structural deficit. And here's this article by Tom Wicker in 1985 in the, in, in the New York Times, quoting Ronald Reagan, qu quoting David Stockman, first of all. David Stockman says, the plan was to have a strategic deficit that would give you an argument for cutting back the programs that weren't desired. The principal purpose of the tax cut was to provide a basis upon which to shrink government. In other words, it was never the case, as Reagan said, that cutting taxes would increase revenue. Never the case. They knew it. Fritz Hollings says, Reagan intentionally created a deficit so large that we Democrats will never have any money to build the sort of government programs we want. And Friedrich von Hayek, in March 25, 1985, in an interview with, uh, with Profile 13 magazine in Vienna, said, uh, pointing out he was wearing a pair of cufflinks that Reagan had given him, said, you see, one of Reagan's advisors told me why the president has permitted this to happen. Reagan thinks it's impossible to persuade Congress that expenditures must be reduced unless one creates deficits so large that absolutely everyone becomes convinced that no more money can be spent. Frederick von Hayek just laid it out. He just said it out loud back in 1984. He said, Mr. Reagan hopes to persuade Congress of the necessity of spending reductions by means of an immense deficit. Bingo. And what, do you hear, what, what is happening right now? 200,000 people are losing their unemployment benefits because Tom Coburn, the Republican, Tom Coburn is saying, we got too much of a deficit. Right.